Well, hello and greetings from Lancashire. As you know, I should be in the, the Crescent this weekend, but because of COVID-19 and uh, government restrictions, then I'm not allowed to travel. And so I'm here with my friend Joe Kirby, and we're recording at 8 o'clock on a Friday morning. Now, I know that some of you don't know that 8 o'clock exists, but it does. So I'm recording, and this is going to put into a Dropbox and sent over to you. And God willing, you'll be watching it on Sunday evening. Now, I've been told that you're going through a series looking at revivals in Second Chronicles. And you've looked at the revival that took place under King Asa, and then Jehoshaphat, and King Uzziah, and also uh, King Hezekiah. And you've given me two Chronicles, chapters 34 and 35, looking at the revival that took place under the reign of King Josiah. Josiah is known as the boy king of Judah. He came to the throne when he was just eight years of age, and sadly he was assassinated by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt when he was just 39 years of age. And so for 31 years he reigned, but what a significant chunk of time that really had a massive impact on the nation of Judah. His grandfather was King Manasseh. And in terms of all the kings of Judah, you cannot get lower than Manasseh. He was the pits. He was, he was a wicked man and he led the nation into gross idolatry. And yet right at the end of his life, Manasseh had what we would call a conversion experience and he repented of his wickedness. But the trouble is the damage had already been done. And so while he repented, the nation didn't. And so Manasseh died and his son came to the throne, Amnon. And Amnon was just as wicked as his father. The conversion of his father didn't make any impact on him at all. And uh, after two years, he was assassinated. This is why Amnon's son, Josiah, came to the throne at such a young age. Josiah obviously grew up to be an adult. He married, he had sons, and three of his sons actually followed him on the throne of Judah, but they were totally godless as well. But isn't it interesting? Here is wicked Manasseh, who has a wicked son, but then suddenly out of that stream of wickedness comes this godly young man, and then he has sons who revert back to family wickedness. If anything, this shows us that grace does not flow in families, and thank God it doesn't. Otherwise, some families would have a monopoly of it, and others would be totally alienated from the grace of God. We thank God that his grace covers all families, and people need to be aware of that, that just because you were born into a so-called Christian or a righteous family, it doesn't mean that you can absorb that by osmosis. And so we thank God that out of this pool of iniquity came this wonderful man called King Josiah. When he died at the age of 39, he was buried in Jerusalem, and his was the final royal burial in that city. The other kings who came after him were not buried in the city. Now, what can I say about this man? Well, I'm going to draw all that I have to say about him from these two chapters you've given me in, in 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. But also in 2 Kings 22 and 23, we have two more chapters about him. So I'm going to, as it were, pull all this information from these four chapters. Now, there's enough here for a series, but I'm going to try and paint with a, a big brush that we just get the general feel as to who this man was and what he did for the Lord. In the book of Kings, he's introduced by three simple statements. Number one, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Number two, he walked in all the ways of his father David. And number three, he did not turn to the right hand or to the left. Now those three statements are incredibly significant. Why is that? Because only seven people outside of Josiah are referred to as doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. And when you think of it, of all the kings that Israel had, and of all the kings that Judah had, and he's the 17th king of Judah, how interesting that only eight kings are given this statement that they did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. As for walking in the ways of his father David, only three kings of Judah are given that title. And already you've looked at those three kings, Asa, Jehoshaphat, and also uh, King Hezekiah. But as for the final statement, he did not turn from the right hand or to the left. He alone has that statement. And so when you go through all the good kings of Judah, 
even though they were good kings they had their weaknesses and even King David he sometimes strayed from the way and we know about that but Josiah is the only king in the whole of scripture of whom it is said he never turned to the left or to the right and therefore he was a man who just kept walking for the Lord let me just tell you briefly what his life was about technically speaking he came to the throne at the age of eight when his father was assassinated but no eight-year-old is mentally capable of running a nation and therefore he relied heavily upon government ministers to help him and to advise him but as he matured in age then he relied on those less and less at the age of 16 it seems from reading the scriptures he had what you may call a conversion experience he began to call on the Lord and he began to seek after the God of his father David at 20 the impact of seeking the Lord was such that he realized that the nation was far from the Lord and so he started to purge the land of anything that smelt of idolatry or immorality and this purge went on for six years at the age of 26 while the land was being purged of idolatry and the temple was being renovated suddenly the scriptures were found and we'll come to that in a few minutes when he read the scriptures that had been lost for some time but now rediscovered he began to weep I mean he realized that they were far from the Lord as a nation and therefore he began to implement some of the things that he read within the Word of God one of the things that he he saw was that they hadn't been celebrating the Passover the greatest feast that God had given to his people the feast that reminded them of how God brought them out of Egypt and by the way 47 times in the Old Testament God reminded his people I brought you out of Egypt and yet they forgot and so he reinstituted the Passover sadly his only mistake is that he dabbled in other people's politics and when Pharaoh Necho was marching north to get involved in, in a larger battle he tried to intercept Pharaoh Necho and, and sadly was brushed aside and killed and that is why he died so young and so here is King Josiah the last good king that Judah ever had and I think he's probably remembered for four specific things and let's just talk about these four things in the time that uh, you have allotted me the first is this he renovated the sanctuary now you know at the heart of Jerusalem was the temple that was built there by Solomon in the days of the Lord Jesus the temple area covered 39 acres it was a massive expanse of ground it wasn't as big as that in the days of the Old Testament but it was still a very big area and, and the temple you couldn't miss it but for 250 years nothing had been done to the physical structure of the temple it would be like a building today having been built in the days of John Wesley 250 years ago and nothing done to it it would look tired it would need a facelift and one of the things that the Josiah did was he said come on this is the house of God look at the state it's in it needs renovating it needs repairing it needs restoring so come on let's work on it he sent runners up and down the land announcing what was going to happen and to say we need money for this and so professional collectors of money were positioned around the nation to receive people's contributions today we would say thousands of pounds came in people bought into the vision and so there was enough money to renovate the whole of the temple a man called Shaphan he was the one given the responsibility of being the overseer for the renovation of the temple when it was finished it was splendid and you can imagine people saying why did we leave it so long we should have dealt with this years ago well done Josiah it's, it's a privilege now to come to the temple to a building that isn't clapped out in an embarrassment but is a credit to the God that we worship and so he renovated the sanctuary when we turn to the New Testament we know that God isn't interested in buildings we know that God doesn't dwell in buildings in fact when Solomon first built the temple he was a little bit uh, concerned about the fact this is God's house but how can God dwell in a house when even the heavens of heavens cannot contain him 
but it was a symbol of the presence of God. It was where God came and dwelt among his people. We know when we come to the New Testament, the New Testament focuses not so much on buildings, but on people. And that God dwells in us. And when Paul wrote to the Colossians in his first chapter, right at the very end, he speaks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the you there is in the plural. He's speaking about the church. Christ dwells in the church. And therefore, at, at one level, the church is, is the building. It's, it's where Christ dwells. So when we talk about renovating the sanctuary, I'm not saying that we've got to ring up the local builder and just give our local church a lick of paint and a facelift. We're talking about renovating the inside, the spiritual. And if anything has become very apparent during COVID-19 is that we need a Josiah attitude to the sanctuary. Let's be quite frank about it. The church in our country looks tired. There are tired shepherds and there are tired sheep and there are tired programs and tired schemes and for years we've just been going through the motions and, and to be honest leaking people left right and center and if one thing is is very apparent to me and I trust it's becoming apparent to you is this we cannot carry on living like this as a church and just saying well it's all over to God we need a move of the Holy Spirit in our building, i.e. our bodies, because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And collectively, we need a move of God in the church as we come together. We need God to, to pour out his Holy Spirit, to renovate us, and to renovate the Christian church. There's a very powerful hymn that we sometimes think here at Inskip, which was written by a lady called Elizabeth Head. All breath of life, Come sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. Or breath of life. Come cleanse, renew us, and fit your church to meet the hour. Oh, wind of God, come bend us, break us, till humbly we confess our need. Then in your tenderness remake us. Revive, restore, for this we plead. Oh, breath of love, come breathe within us. Renewing thought and will and heart. Come love of Christ afresh to win us. Revive your church in every part. And then the final verse says, Revive us, Lord, is zeal abating, while millions stumble into night. Revive us, Lord, the world is waiting. Equip your church to spread the light. The world is in a terrible state. And has been said many times before, the world at its worst needs the church at its best. And a worn out, tired, clapped out, inefficient, unspiritual church is no threat to the godlessness that faces us every day in the streets, in the media, and as we just talk to people in our neighborhood. And one of the prayers of my heart as we come out of COVID-19 is, Lord, as Josiah sought to physically renovate the sanctuary, then Lord, by your grace, may you work through me and other people in the church to do that which we can, but also in union with the Holy Spirit, because Paul tells us we are co-workers with the Spirit, that a work of God may take place, that the church may be fit to meet the need of the hour. One thing has become quite apparent, and that is that the church pre-COVID needed renovating. And while COVID has been quite devastating for all of us, if we're honest, it's been a wake-up call and a fresh canvas for us to say, right, not let's get back to how it was 16 months ago, but Lord, here's a new canvas. How can we seek to do the church in a way that brings glory to your name and lifts high the name of Jesus Christ? And so here's a man who, first of all, he renovated the sanctuary. Secondly, he recovered the scriptures. While the restoration work was taking place in the temple, then, wonder of wonders, the book of the law was found. Now, gallons of ink have been spilt over what was this book. And I don't want to take you down these kind of blind avenues and almost talk a glass eye to sleep 
kind of saying, well, is it this and is it that? Let me just tell you what I believe it was from all my study of the scripture. I believe that this scroll was either the whole book of Deuteronomy or part of it. Now, liberal scholarship doesn't accept that because liberal scholarship doesn't believe that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy and furthermore, it was written a lot later in the history of the nation. That's what they say. So they say, how could it have been found when it hadn't been written? I believe that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy and, and I believe it was already there in operation. But the amazing thing is this, it was lost. And you say, how on earth could God's people lose the book of the law or part of it for years and then suddenly it be rediscovered? But like the church losing the Bible. And we say, surely the church can't lose the Bible. Really? You've got plenty of evidence, surely, as you look around at certain churches, you really wouldn't if they read the Bible at all. So how could God's people lose part of the scriptures that were then rediscovered in the days of, of Josiah? And by the way, the man who's given credit for discovering them is the high priest called Hilkiah. Now, now I personally don't believe that Hilkiah actually found them, just as I don't believe it was Solomon who built the temple, but he gets the credit because, oh, it's Solomon's temple. Well, yes, God sport him about it, but it was people on the ground who did all the hard work. And it was people on the ground who discovered the scrolls, handed it to Hilkiah, the high priest, and he gets the credit, oh, this is the man. Uh, who, who discovered the scrolls. How were they lost? Well, there's two possible suggestions and both are plausible. Have you heard of Codex Sinaiticus? Codex Sinaiticus is one of the most ancient manuscripts that we have of the scriptures. And many Bible translations rely heavily upon the text of the Codex Sinaiticus. Why is it called Sinaiticus? Because it was located in a monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's Monastery. In 1844, a man called Tischendorf was visiting the monastery and one cold morning he was in the library when in came a monk with a basket filled of vellum, old vellum. And he began to screw the vellum up to light this fire to warm the library. Tischendorf happened to kind of look to the side think, what on earth is that? When he went closer to the basket, he discovered this is scripture. And so he said to the monk who was about to light the fire, excuse me, he said, this is scripture. Where's this come from? He said, oh, I've already burned two baskets of this. Stop, said Tischendorf. Well, to bring a, a, a long story to a very short conclusion, it turned out to be Codex Sinaiticus, one of our oldest manuscripts of the scriptures. You say, how could that find its way into a basket to be used as kindling to start a fire? I don't know. But thank God he found it and stopped. Imagine what would have happened if Tischendorf hadn't been there. Would have lost it. How can a monastery lose such an important piece of scripture? I have no idea. But these things can happen. Well, it could well have been that sort of situation that just over the years, as people perhaps began to turn from the Lord and as junk and rubble began to sort of amass itself within the temple, bit by bit the scriptures were pushed out almost to the point of finding themselves in a basket. We don't need this stuff anymore. Could have happened that way. But there's another interpretation which is equally valid and that is this. We know that when enemies used to approach Jerusalem, that sometimes godly priests would hide the scriptures for fear of what would happen to them if they fell into the hands of the enemies of the nation. Remember the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in 1947 down by uh, the Dead Sea? Discovered by a shepherd boy who was looking for a, a lost sheep. What were all those scrolls doing hidden in those jars? Well, it's generally believed they were put there to hide them from the enemy in the hope that when difficult days had passed, the scriptures could then be brought out in one piece and in safety. And some want to argue the reason why the scriptures were lost and rediscovered in the days of Josiah is because during the wicked days of Manasseh and during the wicked days of Amnon, some godly priest said, look, if this carries on, he'll be destroying even the scriptures. So let's hide these out of the way 
so that in days to come we can get them out or who knows people in another generation can rediscover them. Whatever is the right conclusion and who knows one thing is, is clear they were lost but now we're found. Most of the kings of Judah were not really interested in what was written in the Word of God. Manasseh certainly wasn't. Amnon certainly wasn't. And later on we read of one king during the reign of Jeremiah that when the scriptures were read to him, the word of the Lord, he actually cut the scriptures up with a penknife and burnt them. Josiah, remember this man who didn't turn to the left or to the right, who sought to walk in the ways of his father David. When he heard these scriptures that had been hid for years, being read for the first time, he wept. He suddenly realized, wait a minute, I'm a long way from what I just heard. And not only myself, so is the nation. We, we have to do some changes in this nation. And so he sought to, to implement the changes that he read within the word of God. This man had Jeremiah by his side, for Jeremiah was prophesying during this man's ministry. He also had other prophets as well. But you know, in spite of having those men there, something special was added into this situation, whereby he realized this is crucial. Here we are, it's, uh, it's June 2021. Is it possible for God's people in the 21st century to lose the scriptures? Of course it is. The land is littered with so-called spiritual institutions that really know nothing of the truth of God's word. Remember how Peter was following Jesus afar off when it came to Jesus being tried by, by the Sanhedrin. He was there warming himself by the fire and it says Peter followed Jesus afar off. And it seems that in many churches the scriptures follow the church afar off. And, and as as the church warms itself by the world's fire. Jesus is somewhere in the distance, but there's no real connection between Jesus and the disciples. And that's how it is in many churches. Kind of people read the Bible and then close it and let's move on to something else. It is very easy to lose the scriptures. Let me just say three simple things about how easy it is to lose the scriptures. Number one, we lose the scriptures when those who are in the pulpit fail really to expound what is in the scriptures. Having a Bible in your hand doesn't make you biblical. The most biblical people on the face of the earth were the Pharisees. They understood the text, but they missed the message. And I know having expounded God's word for, for most of my life, you can expound the text but miss the message. You can talk about the Greek and the Hebrew, you can explain the background and put a few nice little illustrations in and folk go, wasn't that a lovely word? But you've missed the message. You've totally missed the message. And, and we need to allow the Bible to come out of the Bible, as it were, and to come into the 21st century. And Bible study that stops within the Bible is not Bible study, it's just a history lesson. And so we can lose the scriptures, even in the 21st century, by just doing our Bible bit. You know how it is, you go into a mosque, I guess you've never been into a mosque, but you do all your ablutions, you wash your hands, you wash your feet, you bow down a certain way and come out. That's what they do. And it's very easy for us to come into church, we sing a few hymns, we read the, read the scriptures, the man speaks and we go home and it makes no difference whatsoever. And so we can lose the scriptures when we fail to faithfully expound them. Another way of losing the scriptures is that we pick and choose what we want to believe. A.W. Tozer said on one occasion, the real Bible are all those bits that we don't underline. I have a second-hand Bible here in front of me. I bought it for five pounds, which being for me coming from Lancashire was a bargain. But the person who had it before me, and I got it from a second-hand bookshop, has, has underlined all the great bits. It's like when someone offers you a box of chocolates and you open it and all the good stuff is gone and all the stuff you don't want to eat has been left. And many people treat God's word like that. They take all the soft-centered verses and all the kind of the caramels and the creams that they really like and the mints, but the hard nuts they leave for people like me. No, we've got to take the whole of scripture. When we just start picking and choosing what we want to believe, it's not the word of God that we believe, it's our own opinions that we believe. And thirdly, we fail 
to hold on to the scriptures when we fail to put it into practice. We can be as orthodox as the Apostle Paul, but it doesn't make any difference. Scripture has to be clothed in shoe leather. We have to be inscripturated. It was said of John Bunyan that he was so full of the word of God that wherever you cut him, he would bleed scripture. And that's true when you read his writings. It's the same with the hymns of Charles Wesley. One of the reasons why they've fallen out of favor is because they're so full of scripture that people don't understand the kind of language he's using. I'm not saying that we've got to start throwing around biblical language to be biblical, but God's word has got to get into us. That we not just quote scripture, go, oh, he knows his Bible. Can you believe it? He knows a few verses in Chronicles. No, it, it's not just quoting the Bible, it's being biblical in our thinking. It's, it's, it's expounding God's word by the way we live our life, that we are Bible people. And so here's a man who he, he renovated the sanctuary and also he rediscovered the scriptures. And as we come out of COVID, we need a renovated sanctuary without any doubt at all. And we need to rediscover the truth and the power of God's word. Then it gets a little bit personal and slightly embarrassing here. He then removed the sinful. Having read the scriptures and, and, and seen what they said, he, he certainly realized there are things going on in this nation that have nothing to do with God's work and God's kingdom. They have to go. And uh, basically speaking, Josiah was an iconoclast. I don't think they're very popular in today's generation. He said, things have to go. And so he called together a, a, a meeting of leading officials in the nation and said, this is what I've read in God's word. This is what's going to happen. And because that's the way that the nation ran, it was a theocracy, then they had to listen to the king. And thank God he was a righteous man. And so they, they listened to him. He then made a public covenant so that everyone knew the ground on which he was standing. He said, right, we're going to sort these things out and what is wrong will go. And when you read through Second Chronicles, these two chapters we're looking at here, 34 and 35, and the two chapters in Kings, when you put them all together, he did 13 things to remove the sinful from the nation. Let me briefly just fly through these things. As I said at the very beginning, we could spend a study on each of these points. And, and he takes my breath away. Because one of these things would have been a major achievement, but 13 in such a short reign. And by the way, the fact that it took six years just shows us how ingrained some of these practices were within, not the Philistines, or the Ammonites, or the Girgashites, but the people of God. These are meant to be believers, God's people. And this was going on in the nation of Judah. You would expect it among the Philistines, or the Ammonites, or the Moabites, or the Edomites, but not among the people of God. And the fact that it took six years to get these out just tells us how ingrained and deep-rooted these things have become. Let me just briefly mention some of these things. For a start, in the temple, they were using vessels for the worship of Baal and, and Ashtoreth, Baal is the male, Ashtoreth is the female counterpart, but they were also worshipping astral deities in the temple. And they had vessels for the worship of these gods. The first thing he did was get these out. We don't worship other gods here, and we don't want all these vessels for these gods. Get them out of the temple. Secondly, he gave a P45 to every priest who'd been involved in idolatry. He said, I, I don't want priests here who don't know the Lord. Imagine what would happen in Northern Ireland if the Presbyterian Church sacked every minister who didn't know the Gospel. And what would happen to the Anglican Church and the Methodist Church and the Congregational Church and the Pentecostal Church and the Brethren Church that sacked everybody who just had a name but there was no reality? He said, I don't want people in positions of spiritual leadership who don't know the Lord. So he gave them a P45. He said, uh, thank you for your service, but it's not wanted any longer. And so suddenly there were all these redundant priests. Do you think his name was, was like uh, perfume to their nostrils? They probably loved him. This was a real serious battle. There were also Asherah poles actually put up within the temple. Can you believe it? Asherah poles. 
I mean, Mark can tell you about these things. They were phallic symbols. So people went into the temple, and here were these obscene symbols. Just sometimes when you go into churches today, you, you kind of read things about sexuality in the church thinking, this shouldn't be here. But this is now kind of being broadcast right across the nation of what we do and what we don't do. He said, get these out. You also read in these four chapters that there were booths around the temple. Have you ever been to Amsterdam or to, to Brussels and seen booths where women are selling their wares to people? It's embarrassing. It's, it's not nice. Well, that was going on in Jerusalem. And these booths were known as the houses of the Sodomites. He said, this can't go on. So he said, let's close these down. And then he sent people right throughout the land looking for anything to do with idolatry. Any poles, any altars, you know, any shrines, get rid of them. We want nothing in our land that speaks of idolatry. Sadly, some of his relatives have been involved in child sacrifice. And every now and then when you're reading through Kings and Chronicles, you read of some of the kings who actually burnt their children in the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom is how it was called in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it was called the Valley of Gehenna, just outside Jerusalem. The valley is still there, very deep and very dark. The sun never gets to the bottom. It was the rubbish tip of, of Jerusalem in the days of the Lord Jesus, where they used to burn all the rubbish. In the days of the Old Testament, that's where child sacrifice took place. And Josiah said, remove any evidence of what has taken place in a bygone generation. This is, this is no way for God's people to behave. Children should be safe in our midst, not scared that they're going to be removed. At the entrance to the temple, one of the previous kings had put huge horses there, symbols of the sun. Now a horse is a very kind of fast creature. We speak about horsepower because they have great strength and people race horses because of their speed. And the idea is the sun races through the sky every day. So they said, wouldn't it be nice to have something that represented the sun as we came into the temple? Let's put some strong horses there. Just like I said, we don't need these. We've got the sun. We've got the Lord who made the sun. We don't need symbols like this. And furthermore, it's forbidden in the word of God. Get rid of the horses. Solomon married many, many wives. And uh, these wives were given over to, to many, many gods. We're told of that. It was really the beginning of the end of the nation when he opened his heart to all these women who then brought all these false gods. He built a house, a pantheon for their gods. Can you believe it? A man like Solomon. This house was known as the house or the mount of corruption. They said, that has to go. Having tried to sort out the whole of Judah and get rid of all this nonsense, he then crossed the border. Remember how the nation split? There was Israel in the north and there was Judah in the south. Just north of Judah was, was Bethel. And it's there that a huge altar was built. It was a syncretistic altar, which was a bit of paganism, you know, other religions, and, and, and a bit of Jehovah all mixed together. Everyone felt very happy with that. We're not offending anybody. Right throughout the Old Testament, we keep reading of the sin of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Well, that's, that, that's the sin. Kind of the synchronized religion with all these other religions of, of that day. Josiah crossed the border and actually destroyed the altar. And while, while this air was being destroyed, a grave was uncovered of a prophet who many years before announced a day will come when a king will arise who will be called Josiah who will purge the land. So isn't it amazing? Before Josiah was ever born, he was named and known about. That grave was preserved this man was a good man. Now, I could keep going on and on and on. It's pretty negative stuff, isn't it? He got rid of wizards. He got rid of spiritists and mediums and witches. Anything that was not found within the word of God, he got rid of. 
I wonder what Josiah would say if he came back to the church today. What would he get rid of? And we need to sometimes ask ourselves when we do certain things, what we're doing here in this country, do we do it because we're British or because we're biblical? What takes precedence, culture or scripture? Who rules our lives? Because it's very easy to sort of read all this stuff in the Old Testament and go, isn't that nice? What a wonderful man of God he was. And then to leave it within the Bible. But as soon as you try and bring this out of scripture and bring it into your own world, it's then that your trouble starts to say, I'm sorry, we can't have that. And we can't stand for that because that is contrary to God's word. And that's when you start to run into trouble because people go, oh, hang on a minute, this is a bit strong. Well, I'm sure that's what people said to Josiah. Let me just tell you three simple things before we come to the final point. Spiritual renewal is always connected to the Word of God. It's not that Josiah got out of bed one day and had a bit of a hump and thought, you know, I just don't like Baal and I don't like his female counterpart. Let's get rid of them. They're not my kind of gods. No, all this came out of the Word of God. And true spiritual renewal always comes out of the Word of God because God's Word is our standard. Scripture tells us that. You I mean, we, we build our lives on the Word of God. Not, not the paper, not the book, but we believe, you see, that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. So we're not worshipping paper. We're not kind of uh, idolaters of some book, as sometimes people accuse us. No, we believe this is the breath of God in print. So when this book speaks, God speaks. It's amazing how many people in the 21st century are waiting for a word from the Lord but ignore all the words that have come before this word that they're waiting for. As if I don't want any of that stuff. I want a fresh word. Well, believe me, God's word is powerful and fresh because God lives in an everlasting now. And whether God spoke 10,000 years ago or a million years ago, it makes no difference. God's word is always fresh. Always fresh. And so any form of spiritual renewal has to be rooted in the Word of God, for it's from there that it comes. But secondly, spiritual renewal does not always lead to revival. It's amazing, isn't it, how Josiah was keen in renovating and renewing and restoring, and he gets our full support, but it didn't work. Why is that? Because you cannot legislate for people's hearts. You can try your best, but you cannot legislate for people's hearts. You can try and put systems in place, but if people's hearts are bent towards evil, believe me, when your back is turned, they'll go back to what you have got rid of. And sometimes it's also true of churches that no matter what you do in a church, at the end of the day, churches will revert to type because they don't see the truth. Jeremiah, who was a prophet at this time, had a very powerful word to say in chapter 3, verse 10. Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense. So while the heart of Josiah and many were keen on seeing renewal and, and God working in the nation, not everybody, they did it because the king said it, and I don't want to die, so I'll just go along with the king. But as soon as he's dead, I'll go and do my own thing, which is exactly what happened. And within 10 years of this man dying, Babylon was knocking on the door. Why? Because the nation, sadly, in spite of all this, had turned its back on the Lord. But here's one final thought that comes out of this. Spiritual renewal always brings us nearer to the Lord and further from the false. On about a hundred occasions in the Old Testament, there are references to the children of Israel dabbling in idolatry and God saying, stop it turn to me. And you can always tell when there's a real move of God and that is that people turn away from that which is false and they turn to that which is true. They get closer to the Lord. Is your heart warming to this man? I wonder what would have happened if he'd have lived, say, to 70 like David or Solomon. 39 from our point of view is too young. He was almost God's last gift to the nation, saying, if you don't listen to this man, there's nothing more I can do for you. I'll give you your heart's desire. 
I tell you, what a wonderful, wonderful, brave man he was. I guess he had many a sleepless night. And I guess behind his back some folk kind of threw the knives and were very critical. But what, what a way to go out of life. He didn't move from the left or to the right. He walked in the ways of his father David. And he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. The final thing he did was he reinstated the supreme. What's the supreme? The Passover. 19 verses are given over to the celebration of the Passover. Listen to this in verse 18 of chapter 35. There had been no Passover kept in Israel like that since the days of Samuel the prophet. And none of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as Josiah kept. What were they doing? Can you believe it? The greatest the greatest event in, in the nation's history coming out of Egypt, they forget it. And so he, he realizes it hasn't been celebrated. Right, let's get this back in. And what an occasion it is. You read about it here in chapter 35. The animals that were used, the thousands of animals. I just wrote down four words in my notes. Think of the heat, the smell, the fumes, the wood that was consumed to burn all these animals. What an occasion! Lambs, goats, bulls, the whole thing was phenomenal. Why does the chronicler give us 19 verses on just remembering the Passover? To let us know that redemption was at the heart of what Josiah was doing. This man was a Passover man. This man was shaped by the Word of God and also by what God's Word taught, i.e. I am a God who has brought you out of bondage into total liberty. Shouldn't we be Passover people? Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, said, Christ is our Passover. What is the greatest thing that has ever happened for us? Is that Jesus Christ died on the cross, God's Passover lamb, to be our Saviour. How can we ever forget what Jesus Christ has done for us? It should mark our lives. It should shape our lives. It should shape our thinking. God forbid that many churches in our country have forgotten Calvary. And many churches these days are no longer Calvary churches. And they're certainly not gospel churches. I haven't a clue what they are. There's lots of kind of singing, a bit of talking about spirituality, being relevant. And then we just go out and live our lives. What our land needs is redemption people. People who've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. People who've been forgiven and cleansed by the Lord Jesus. We need churches like that, that can rediscover what the gospel is, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so the Chronicle says, if you want to understand Josiah, look at this big event, the Passover. What a massive statement. He was a man who understood redemption. Sadly, 10 years after this, Babylon came. And that was the beginning of the end. But let me finish on something which I find quite interesting. During the final few years of the reign of Josiah, which must have been very painful for those who've been committed to idolatry in all its different colors and shapes and forms. There were some godly people. And during this time, there was a godly couple. We don't know their names, but they had a son. We know what they called their son. God who judges. How does that translate into Hebrew? Daniel. Daniel. When the Babylonians came down, and knocked on the door, for they came three times and knocked on the door. In fact, the final time they didn't knock on the door, they flattened everything. But the first time they knocked on the door and they took some young hostages back from Jerusalem up to Babylon. They took a number of teenage boys. Daniel was one of them. God is my judge. He would judge. They also took Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. You read of those characters in the book of Daniel 
And I find it so refreshing that at one level you may think, all this for nothing. The nation goes into exile, the king dies because he dabbles in the politics of Egypt. What was all that about? But listen, out of this came a handful of godly young men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, I'm sure there are others. And it says, Daniel continued for 70 years with his eyes on the Lord. I wonder who his inspiration was. Jeremiah? For Daniel would have heard Jeremiah preach. King Josiah? Daniel as a young man would have been very much aware of King Josiah. And when all seemed lost, and when the walls were flattened, and the temple was destroyed, and the people were taken into exile, and it looked like it was all over, there was a remnant of godly people in Babylon that God was working in. So much so, he even allowed him to write a book, the book of Daniel. Things look pretty grim, if we're quite honest, in our country. They don't look really exciting, do they, as we kind of come out of COVID-19. There are sheep who are going AWOL, churches that are losing their focus. People say, I'm not coming back to church. I'm stopping at home. I'm doing my own church. With all this confusion going on, my prayer is that God may raise up Daniel's, Hananiah's, Mishael's, Azariah's, young men, young women, who will purpose in their heart to serve God wholeheartedly. Can I encourage you? Be like Josiah. You'll be in a very small group, it doesn't matter, but don't stray to the right or to the left. Try and walk in the footsteps, not of your father David, but in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And make sure that redemption is the center of your life. What do you read of that? You read of it in the Word of God. May God renew me, my sanctuary, you, your sanctuary. May God renew the crescent. May God renew this church. May the scriptures be central. And may God do something in our midst that in a generation to come, there'll be people who will say, thank God for what happened in this church. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, studying history is one thing, but letting your words speak from the past in the 21st century suddenly becomes challenging and a different thing altogether. Lord, forgive us for thinking that we can just look at Josiah and close the book and say, what a nice man. I wonder what we're looking at next week. We simply ask and pray, would you give us the courage and the boldness of this man and give us the vision. And Lord, whatever happened when he was 16, we pray something like that may happen in us, that you may wake us up and that you may renew us. We're not asking to be popular. We're not asking to be famous. We're just asking to be Calvary people who were impacted by Jesus, who were shaped by the Word of God, and who seek to live in such a way that we don't turn to the right or to the left, but we keep walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Father, take hold of these few words, and please use them to do our souls good, and for the honour of your name, and even for the saving of lost people. Father, I simply ask this, in the name of our lovely Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen.